Welcome to the Canadian edition of the Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. You instilled in me the truth of the Word of God and in my husband that led to my healing and the changes in my life and my family's life and in our future. And now here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm in the middle of my fourth week teaching verse by verse through the book of Hebrews, and we have some brand new product. This is a hardback edition, 200 plus pages of my teaching verse by verse through Hebrews. This is taken from my living commentary, which is a digital commentary where I've written footnotes on over 27,000 verses in the Bible. And this is just the portion that covers the book of Hebrews that we've printed out. And this is a brand new product that we're offering. I think this is going to be awesome. It'll really help people. And then we also have CDs, DVDs, and a USB that are taken from these actual television programs. And I'm telling you, studying the book of Hebrews and understanding what it says is absolutely essential to Christian maturity. And I would dare to say that the majority of people watching this program right now do not really study the book of Hebrews. And even if you've read it, many people would just say, it seems like it's hard to understand. And as it said over in Hebrews chapter 5, the reason it's hard to understand is because we are dull of hearing. We haven't grown and matured in the word of righteousness. And a lot of that comes from the fact that people haven't transitioned from the old covenant law into the New Testament grace. And so this is what the book of Hebrews is all about. And even though it takes a little bit of effort, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, we have to labor to enter into this rest. It, it takes some effort, but it is well worth the effort. And so I'm going verse by verse through. We are now in Hebrews chapter 6, and I'm breaking right into some things, but let me just back up and read a couple of verses that I covered on the program yesterday. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, that's you and me, the immutability, that means unchangeableness of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. And this is going back and uh, referring to an Old Testament scripture where God promised to Abraham, he swore by himself that he would bless Abraham and make his seed as numerous as the stars in the sky or the grains of sand on the seashore. And then in verse 18, it says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And I talked about those things yesterday, but man, what a great promise that it's impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. It would be against his nature if God was to ever lie, it, he would cease to be God. He wouldn't be the person that he is. And so you can take any promise that God has ever given us to the bank. I guarantee you, God cannot lie. And we need to get such an assurance of that that it just kills the unbelief in us. And so it says, By two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. And I talked just a little bit at the end of yesterday's program about hope, that hope is like the thermostat on the faith unit. You know, I'll deal with this more when we get into Hebrews chapter 11. But in the same way that a thermostat doesn't cool a room, but it controls the unit that does cool the room, and if you don't have a thermostat, and if your thermostat is set wrong, then even though you had a power unit that could produce air conditioning or heat or something like that, it would never come on. It wouldn't have to activate if the uh, thermostat isn't working. So hope is like the thermostat that causes faith to work. I'm going to deal with that in more detail, but hope is a powerful thing. Matter of fact, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I believe it's verse 13, it says, Now about a faith hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So it lists three things, and the last thing that it listed was love and said that was the greatest. So if the last thing 
was the greatest, then you could just extrapolate from that that the, the thing that was second in the list would be the next greatest, and then faith would be the least of those three. So we emphasize love and we emphasize faith, but very seldom do people talk about hope. But hope is just your positive expectation of something good. And I haven't got time to go into this, but one of the revelations that God has shown me that has really made a difference in my life, I believe that hope is a positive imagination. You can have negative imagination, which worry is a negative imagination. Just your ability to picture or to see things in your heart that haven't come to pass yet, but you're expecting dread, you're expecting negative things, worry, dread, fear, all of that is a negative imagination. But hope is a positive imagination. And I've got an entire book entitled The Power of Imagination, and this is one of the things that God used that has literally transformed my life. It has changed me to learning how to use my imagination in a positive way. And so it says in verse 19, this hope we have is an anchor of the soul. And notice it says, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth in to that within the veil. Now again, there's a lot of Christians that just honestly haven't spent the time to understand what the wording here is talking about, but this is talking about the Old Testament tabernacle. This is just a little rendering of what the Old Testament tabernacle would look like. So there was an outer curtain that went all the way around it, and then there was the actual tabernacle in the center, and it was separated into two parts. I have another little artist rendering, and it shows this outer thing here is the curtain that went around the entire thing, but then this tabernacle inside was divided into two parts called the holy place and the holy of holies. And the holy place, the priest would go in there. There was a show bread. Uh, there was a table where they baked bread every day and put it in there. There was a candlestick, and there was an altar of incense where they burned incense. It was symbolic of prayer. But then there was this veil that separated these two portions of the tabernacle and the holy place. The priest would go into that at all times, but then the holy of holies was a place where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt and the high priest could only go in there once a year. And I'll be talking about some of these things in more detail as we get further into Hebrews. But this verse 19 says, that this hope is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth in to that within the veil. What that's talking about is that it goes right into the very presence of God, into the Ark of the Covenant, this holy place. And hope is what keeps us anchored directly to a relationship with God. Again, we could go into much more detail talking about this, but it's going to be repeated over in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, how that we now have boldness to enter right into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus and the veil. And it says that this veil is Christ's flesh and it's been separated. It's been uh, torn in two from the top to the bottom so that there's no longer any separation between God and man. For those who have accepted Jesus and what he did, now all of the restrictions are removed and we can just anchor ourselves right into the presence of God. Again, this symbolism is lost on most people because they don't really understand the old covenant and the way things were done. The Old Testament tabernacle and then later Solomon's temple, they were patterns of what Moses saw in, in heaven. When he was on the mountain, he literally saw into heaven and saw the temple in heaven and he patterned Moses' tabernacle after that. And there was this separation between God and man because of sin. Isaiah chapter 59 says that our sins have separated us from God. And in the Old Testament, there was this separation. In the New Testament, it's gone. And this is referring to that and sometimes people miss the significance because they aren't really aware of how the Old Testament tabernacle was. But when you have a hope in Jesus, when your hope is in Him and what He's done for you instead of what you are doing for Him, when you are really resting in Him and what He has done, 
THAT IS LIKE AN ANCHOR THAT GOES RIGHT INTO THE VERY PRESENCE OF GOD AND IT KEEPS YOU FROM DRIFTING AWAY, FROM BEING TORN AWAY FROM GOD AND TAKEN AWAY. IT KEEPS YOU ANCHORED RIGHT INTO THE VERY HOLY OF HOLIES. MAN, THAT'S POWERFUL. AND HOPE IS JUST A MUCH, MUCH, MUCH STRONGER FORCE THAN WHAT MOST PEOPLE HAVE GIVEN IT. YOU KNOW, I OFTEN HAVE PEOPLE COME AND THEY'RE ASKING ABOUT HOW TO RECEIVE A HEALING OR PROSPERITY OR SOMETHING ELSE, AND I'LL TEACH THEM ABOUT FAITH AND THINGS LIKE THIS, AND THEY JUST STRUGGLE WITH FAITH. BUT DID YOU KNOW FAITH, (coughs) EXCUSE ME, IS JUST ACTUALLY AN AUTOMATIC RESULTS. IT'S A BYPRODUCT OF HOPE. AND AGAIN, I HAVEN'T GOT TIME TO GO INTO THIS COMPLETELY. I'VE GOT A BOOK ENTITLED THE POWER OF IMAGINATION. YOU COULD CALL OR WRITE AND RECEIVE THAT. GO TO OUR WEBSITE AND GET IT. BUT IF YOU UNDERSTAND THAT HOPE IS JUST A POSITIVE IMAGINATION. WHEN THE LORD SHOWED ME THIS, I WAS IN THE PROCESS OF BUILDING OUT A CAMPUS FOR OUR Caris BIBLE COLLEGE, AND I KNEW THAT WE NEEDED THE SPACE, BUT I JUST COULDN'T SEE IT. AND THE LORD SHOWED ME I NEEDED TO START HAVING A POSITIVE IMAGINATION. AND WHEN I STARTED RELEASING THIS, AND AGAIN, I HADN'T GOT TIME TO GO INTO DETAIL OF HOW I DID IT, BUT ONCE I SAW IT ON THE INSIDE, ONCE MY IMAGINATION SAW THESE BUILDINGS AND THE THINGS THAT GOD CALLED ME TO DO, FAITH JUST GOES THROUGH THE ROOF. FAITH IS A BYPRODUCT OF HOPE. AND IF YOU DON'T HAVE HOPE, IF YOU HAVEN'T SEEN IT IN YOUR HEART, YOU AREN'T GOING TO BE ABLE TO SEE IT WITH YOUR EYES. AND THERE'S A LOT OF PEOPLE THAT TRY AND PASS THESE STEPS. LIKE, FOR INSTANCE, WHEN IT COMES TO HEALING, THEY'RE PRAYING, OH, GOD, HEAL ME. BUT HAVE YOU EVER SEEN YOURSELF HEALED? THERE'S A LOT OF PEOPLE THAT SEE YOURSELF SICK. YOU SEE YOURSELF POOR. YOU SEE YOURSELF DEPRESSED. YOU SEE YOURSELF IN FEAR. YOU'VE NEVER SEEN YOURSELF IN CHRIST. YOU'VE NEVER SEEN THE JOY OF THE LORD OPERATING IN YOU. YOUR IDENTITY HAS BEEN FORGED BY THE NEGATIVE THINGS THAT YOU'RE GOING THROUGH. SO YOU'VE NEVER SEEN IT ON THE INSIDE, BUT YOU'RE PRAYING THAT YOU'LL SEE IT ON THE OUTSIDE. THAT'S NOT WHAT THE WORD OF GOD TEACHES. YOU HAVE TO BELIEVE THAT YOU RECEIVE THE MOMENT YOU PRAY AND YOU HAVE TO USE YOUR IMAGINATION, A POSITIVE HOPE TO SEE HEALING, PROSPERITY, DELIVERANCE, ALL OF THESE THINGS ON THE INSIDE BEFORE YOU SEE IT ON THE OUTSIDE. AND MY PERSONAL TESTIMONY IS THAT ONCE I CAN TAKE THE WORD OF GOD AND LET IT PAINT A PICTURE ON THE INSIDE OF ME, AND ONCE I SEE MYSELF HEALED, THEN FAITH JUST AUTOMATICALLY BRINGS THAT TO PASS. YOU KNOW, LET ME USE AN ILLUSTRATION OF THIS. AT ONE TIME, JAMIE AND I WERE uh, NEEDING A NEW CAR. THE ONE WE WERE DRIVING WAS JUST ABOUT GONE, AND WE NEEDED ONE, BUT WE DIDN'T REALLY HAVE VERY MUCH MONEY, AND I WASN'T READY TO COMMIT MYSELF TO GOING OUT AND GETTING A LOAN TO GET A CAR, BUT I THOUGHT IT WAS JUST PRUDENT TO START LOOKING. SO WE WENT TO A CAR DEALERSHIP, AND I TOLD THE GUY, I SAID, I'M NOT GOING TO BUY ANYTHING TODAY. WE DON'T HAVE THE MONEY TODAY. WE AREN'T PREPARED, BUT WE JUST NEED TO START THINKING ABOUT WHAT IT'S GOING TO COST, WHAT WE HAVE TO DO IN ORDER TO BE GETTING A NEW CAR. WELL, THIS SALESMAN, THEY UNDERSTAND THE POWER OF IMAGINATION. AND SO INSTEAD OF JUST GIVING ME FACTS AND ANSWERING MY QUESTIONS THE WAY THAT I WAS ASKING THEM, HE SAID, OH, NO, YOU GOT TO SIT IN THIS CAR. SO HE MADE ME GO SIT IN THE CAR. AND THEN HE SAID, YOU GOT TO DRIVE IT AROUND THE BLOCK. AND I KEPT TELLING HIM, I'M NOT READY TO BUY OR ANYTHING. BUT HE, he, WHAT HE WAS DOING, HE WAS PUTTING ME IN A POSITION WHERE I COULD SEE MYSELF IN THAT CAR. AND DID YOU KNOW, I WENT THERE WITH NO MOTIVATION WHATSOEVER TO GET A CAR. I WAS JUST THINKING IT WAS PRACTICAL TO START PLANNING AND THINKING AHEAD. BUT AFTER SITTING IN THAT CAR, DRIVING IT AROUND THE BLOCK AND COMPARING THE RIDE OF THAT NEW CAR TO THE BUMPINESS OF MY OLD CAR AND THE NEW CAR SMELL VERSUS THE SMELL WE HAD IN OUR OLD CAR AND JUST ALL OF THESE KIND OF THINGS. WHEN I GOT HOME, I STAYED UP HALF THE NIGHT TRYING TO FIGURE OUT HOW CAN I DO THIS. I WAS MOTIVATED. MY FAITH BEGAN TO KICK IN AND I STARTED TRYING TO BRING IT TO PASS. AND THAT IS AN ILLUSTRATION, SEE, OF ONCE YOU CAN SEE YOURSELF DOING SOMETHING, FAITH WILL JUST KICK IN AND TRY AND MAKE IT COME TO PASS. AND MANY TIMES PEOPLE SKIP THIS HOPE STAGE AND THEY JUST TRY AND GO STRAIGHT FROM LIKE BEING TERMINALLY ILL AND THEY'VE LOOKED UP ON THE INTERNET AND SEEN ALL OF THE NEGATIVE AND THEY'VE SEEN ALL OF THESE PEOPLE THAT HAVE DIED AND MAYBE THEY'VE GOT SOMEBODY THEY KNEW THAT HAD THE SAME THING THAT DIED OF IT AND YOU'VE GOT THIS NEGATIVE IMAGE ON THE INSIDE OF YOU. THAT'S A NEGATIVE IMAGINATION 
AND YET YOU'RE TRYING TO BELIEVE FOR A POSITIVE OUTCOME. THE SCRIPTURE SAYS IN PROVERBS 23, 7, AS YOU THINK IN YOUR HEART, THAT'S THE WAY IT'S GOING TO BE. AND IF YOU SEE YOURSELF SICK AND DYING, IT DOESN'T MATTER IF YOU PRAY FOR HEALING, YOU ARE GOING TO DIE BECAUSE THAT'S WHAT YOU SEE AS YOU THINK IN YOUR HEART. THAT'S THE WAY IT IS. SO WE NEED TO PUT MORE EMPHASIS ON HOPE AND JUST STARTING THE PROCESS. AND MAYBE YOU AREN'T TO A PLACE YET TO WHERE YOU CAN BELIEVE THAT YOU'RE COMPLETELY HEALED. BUT CAN YOU HOPE IT? CAN YOU TAKE SCRIPTURES AND SEE OTHER PEOPLE THAT WERE HEALED? GO TO THE MINISTRY OF JESUS AND SEE PEOPLE THAT WERE HEALED OF THE EXACT SAME THING THAT YOU'VE GOT, AND YOU CAN LIVE VICARIOUSLY THROUGH THAT AND SAY, WELL, GOD, IF YOU DID IT FOR THEM, I'M HOPING THAT YOU CAN DO IT FOR ME. THAT'S NOT THE FINAL RESULTS. IT'S FAITH IS THE VICTORY THAT OVERCOMES THE WORLD, BUT FAITH IS THE SUBSTANCE OF THINGS THAT HOPED FOR. SO YOU HAVE TO START WITH HOPE. ANYWAY, I COULD PREACH ON HOPE FOR A LONG TIME and IMAGINATION, BUT THIS IS SAYING THAT THIS HOPE IS LIKE AN ANCHOR OF THE SOUL. DID YOU KNOW YOUR SPIRIT IS A PART OF YOU THAT'S BORN AGAIN, AND IT IS ALWAYS OPERATING IN LOVE, JOY, PEACE, ALL THE FRUIT OF THE SPIRIT. YOUR SPIRIT, BORN AGAIN SPIRIT, IS NOT YOUR PROBLEM. YOUR SOUL IS YOUR PROBLEM. THAT'S YOUR MENTAL AND EMOTIONAL PART, AND THAT'S WHERE YOU GET INTO TROUBLE. THAT'S WHERE YOU FEEL FEAR AND DOUBT AND ALL OF THESE KIND OF THINGS. SO YOUR SPIRIT IS FINE IF YOU'RE BORN AGAIN, AND IT'S SEALED BY THE HOLY SPIRIT, EPHESIANS 1, 13. BUT YOUR SOUL IS THE PROBLEM. HOW DO YOU KEEP YOUR SOUL IN TUNE WITH YOUR SPIRIT AND WHAT YOU'VE RECEIVED THROUGH CHRIST? HOPE IS AN ANCHOR OF THE SOUL THAT WILL ANCHOR YOU RIGHT INTO THE VERY HOLY OF HOLIES. AND IN THE ARK OF THE COVENANT IS WHERE THE WORD OF GOD WAS PLACED. YOUR HOPE HAS TO BE ANCHORED TO THE WORD OF GOD. MAN, THAT'S AWESOME. LIKE I SAID, I COULD TALK ABOUT THAT FOR A VERY LONG TIME. AND IN THE NEXT VERSE, IT SAYS, WHETHER THE FORERUNNER IS FOR US ENTERED, EVEN JESUS MADE AN HIGH PRIEST FOREVER AFTER THE ORDER OF MELCHIZEDEK. FOR THOSE OF YOU THAT HAVE WATCHED THIS PROGRAM ON A REGULAR BASIS, uh, IN uh, HEBREWS CHAPTER 5, THE WRITER BROUGHT THIS UP, THAT JESUS WAS PROPHESIED TO BE AN, A PRIEST AFTER THE ORDER OF MELCHIZEDEK, AND HE WANTED TO GET INTO TEACHING ABOUT MELCHIZEDEK IN THE FIFTH CHAPTER OF THE BOOK OF HEBREWS, BUT HE SAYS, YOU'RE JUST TOO DULL. You are, YOU'RE TOO IMMATURE. YOU CAN'T UNDERSTAND THIS. SO HE SPENT THE END OF THE FIFTH CHAPTER AND THEN ALL OF THE SIXTH CHAPTER TRYING TO ENCOURAGE PEOPLE TO GO BEYOND JUST THE BASICS AND GETTING INTO THESE DEEPER THINGS OF GOD. SO NOW IN THIS LAST VERSE OF THE SIXTH CHAPTER, HE BRINGS THEM BACK TO WHERE HE WAS uh, IN THE FIFTH CHAPTER AND GOES BACK TO TALKING ABOUT MELCHIZEDEK BEING A HIGH PRIEST AND JESUS BEING A HIGH PRIEST AFTER THE ORDER OF MELCHIZEDEK. SO HE'S NOW COME FULL CIRCLE AFTER TAKING THIS LITTLE RABBIT TRAIL OR THIS PARENTHETICAL PHRASE ABOUT HOW THAT YOU NEED TO GROW UP AND GET BEYOND JUST GETTING BORN AGAIN AND YOU NEED TO GET INTO SOME OF THE DEEPER THINGS OF GOD. SO IN THE SEVENTH CHAPTER, NOW HE BEGINS TO START GETTING INTO DETAIL ABOUT JESUS BEING A PRIEST FOREVER AFTER THE ORDER OF MELCHIZEDEK. AND FOR THOSE OF YOU WHO DIDN'T SEE THE PREVIOUS PROGRAMS WHERE I TALKED A LITTLE BIT ABOUT THIS, OR EVEN IF YOU SAW IT, I KNOW THAT PEOPLE SLEEP FROM DAY TO DAY, AND SOMETIMES THEY FORGET THINGS THAT THEY'VE HEARD. BUT THIS WAS A RADICAL STATEMENT TO THE HEBREWS. THIS BOOK WAS WRITTEN TO JEWS, HEBREWS, AND IT WAS WRITTEN TO TRANSITION THEM FROM THE OLD COVENANT WAY OF RELATING TO GOD TO A BRAND NEW COVENANT THROUGH JESUS. IT WAS DIAMETRICALLY DIFFERENT FROM WHAT THE OLD COVENANT SAID. AND ONE OF THOSE GREATEST CONTRADICTIONS IS ABOUT JESUS BEING OUR HIGH PRIEST. BECAUSE UNDER THE OLD TESTAMENT LAW, YOU HAD TO BE A JEW, AND SPECIFICALLY A JEW OUT OF THE TRIBE OF JUDAH, AND EVEN MORE SPECIFICALLY, a Jew out of the tribe, or excuse me, is a Jew out of the tribe of Levi. That's where the priests were. And even more specifically, a Jew out of the tribe of Levi and out of the house of Aaron, which was just a small segment of the tribe of Levi. So you had to be a Levite an, uh, out of the tribe of Aaron in order to be a priest. And yet here is Melchizedek, who wasn't even a Jew. AND THIS IS PROPHESYING THAT JESUS WOULD BE A PRIEST AFTER THE ORDER OF MELCHIZEDEK. JESUS CAME OUT OF THE TRIBE OF JUDAH, NOT A PRIESTLY TRIBE. AND SO 
If, if the priesthood has to be changed, then the whole law's got to be changed. The whole way of relating to God has to be changed. And that's what Hebrews chapter 7 is all about. And so I'm going to try and kind of go through this quickly because this is something that a lot of people just, uh, they get lost in the detail of this, but it's in the Bible and I believe it's important our God wouldn't have put it in there. So let me just summarize some things and I'll come back on tomorrow's broadcast and go back through some of this. But it says in verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness and after that also king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, that's what this is referring to, where it says the king of righteousness and also the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. The word Salem meant peace and... Uh, Melchizedek meant king of righteousness. So it's using the interpretation of his name and of the name of his city to show that he was a king of righteousness and a king of peace. He came out and Abraham gave him a tenth, a tithe off of all of the spoil that he had received from these battles. And this is going to become one of the major points in this thing. I'm going to summarize this on tomorrow's uh, program. I don't have time today to go into all of this. But the, but the basic point is the writer of Hebrews is showing that Melchizedek was superior to Abraham, therefore superior to uh, Levi who came out of Abraham and the house of Aaron and the priesthood and all of these things. And he shows it because Abraham paid a tithe to uh, Melchizedek and also Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And without any contradiction, the less is blessed of the greater. So he's saying all of these things to show you that Melchizedek's priesthood was greater than the Levitical priesthood. And since Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, then Jesus' priesthood was greater than the high priest and the priesthood that was under the law. And man, this was a radical, radical statement to the Hebrews of those days. And this showed that if you change the priesthood, you've also got to change the law. So we will be dealing with that on tomorrow's program. This is a book that I took from my living commentary and I've printed out the footnotes on every single verse in the book of Hebrews. This is over 200 pages. First time we've offered this book, it's a hard copy book and we are asking you to give a donation for this. And then we also have a product where it takes the teaching from my television programs and I have DVDs, CDs, and a USB that will have the audio and the video on there. And again, I just want to stress that this book of Hebrews is absolutely essential for Christian maturity. If you don't understand these things, according to Hebrews chapter 5, you are not skillful in the word of righteousness. You're a babe and haven't got in to the spiritual things yet. So please listen to our announcer and take advantage of these materials. Do you want to dive deeper into God's Word? Now you can with Andrew Womack's Living Commentary. I'd like to encourage you to get this Living Commentary. We call it a Living Commentary because I'm still writing it. And I've written footnotes on over 27,000 verses in the Bible. And I promise you, this is powerful. It's not only got my commentary and experiences and revelations that God has given me, it's got Greek and Hebrew words defined. It's got references and just all kinds of things here. It would be a tremendous blessing to you. So check it out, our Living Commentary. The Living Commentary includes two dictionaries, four commentaries, and 12 versions of the Bible, plus atlases and biblical maps. Grow in the Word with Andrew's Living Commentary software. You can enjoy the Word of God wherever you are, on your phone, computer, or tablet. Download the Living Commentary today. Andrew is pleased to announce the release of his brand new book, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality. This hardback book includes all of Andrew's personal study notes and commentary on the book of Hebrews as compiled from Andrew's Living Commentary software. Discover the transformative truths of the book of Hebrews when you get Andrew's brand new book, Hebrews Living in the New Covenant Reality Today. Andrew's complete series, Hebrews Living in the New Covenant Reality, is available as a book, 
CD album, TV, DVD album, and USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available when you contact us. Go to our website at awmc.ca to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada Helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order. I want to encourage you to listen in to our Truth and Liberty broadcast. We do this every Wednesday and Friday at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. And this is not only teaching from the Word of God, that's the truth part of it, God's Word is truth, but also we're talking about current events and we're gonna be dealing with things that affect us and I believe we'll be dealing with it from a biblical perspective. It'll be a real blessing to you. So check it out every Wednesday and Friday, our Truth and Liberty program, 4 p.m. Mountain Time. You were created with a purpose in the heart of God long before you were born he is calling you to find it we want to help you experience his unconditional love to be equipped and empowered to become a world changer I'd like to let all of you, our Canadian viewers, know that we have a Bible college in Toronto, and we would love to have you come and be a part of it. There's multiple ways you can take advantage, not only through the campus there in Toronto, but we have online courses, we have correspondence courses, uh, just a number of ways, but we want to help you, and we're making it as available to you as we possibly can. So check it out with the information's on your screen, our Caris Bible College, Toronto. If Andrew's teachings are making a difference in your life, consider becoming a Grace Partner with Andrew Womack Ministries Canada today. Grace Partners are special friends of the ministry who commit to giving $30 or more per month to help Andrew reach thousands of people here in Canada and around the world with a life-changing message of God's unconditional love and grace. If you'd like to become a Grace Partner today, go to awmc.ca or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220. Also, to learn more about the vision and mission of Andrew Womack Ministries Canada, be sure to visit our website at awmc.ca. While there, you'll also find details about all of the products available and be able to access many of Andrew's teachings absolutely free. You can listen to them while you're online or download them for later and listen on the go. Remember, that's awmc.ca. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to hearing from you today. Andrew has many conferences and seminars around the globe each year. For the latest information on Andrew's complete speaking schedule, visit our website at awmc.ca slash events.